Thank you for joining me for this Lifeway study of the Book of Lamentations. This is session 13. The title is Good, and the text is Lamentations 3, verses 19 to 33. This is our 13th session. The way I'm introducing the lesson is I've written a question on the board, uh, thinking back over this month, what are ways that you've encountered people suffering? And it may be very surprising about all the suffering that people have encountered uh, in terms of when you consider it in a class. And this is a lesson about a suffering people and how they found hope in the midst of their suffering. The lesson summary statement is God's presence gives His people peace. And what I find interesting as well is the title of this lesson, It's Good. It's, it strikes me as ironic. Here are people who are suffering horribly. In fact, they're suffering more than probably any of us can imagine, and yet Jeremiah's experience with God is good. And so this is a very needed lesson for people today. Now, there are a number of things about Lamentations that you'll want to point out to your class. Uh, Lamentations is a warning light to anyone that's being pulled away from the path of God's will. Lamentations is anonymous. Uh, most scholars believe that Jeremiah was, uh, is the one who wrote the book, and it was most associated with uh, Jeremiah when the Septuagint was written. Uh, it's composed after the fall of Jerusalem, and there are many good reasons to believe that it's Jeremiah. The entire book is poetic. Each chapter has 22 verses, and those verses uh, correspond to the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So each verse starts with the, the next corresponding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's only one exception to that, and that happens to be chapter 3. In chapter 3, there are 66 verses, so three letters with each letter of the alphabet in the Hebrew alphabet. Lamentations is composed solely of laments, and you'd cry too if you lived through the destruction and the death of your nation. If you go to Jerusalem and you go to the Wailing Wall, you will hear them read the book of Lamentations every week as the people gather at the wall to pray for the city and to pray for the people. The Roman Catholics read Lamentations, the last three days of the Holy Week. But by and large, Protestants and Evangelicals have largely ignored the book. Now, as I mentioned, the book is an acrostic. It takes the Hebrew alphabet and it works its way through the alphabet in delivering the message in each of the chapters. And what, it, what that is, is that's a memory device. And it's almost as if Jeremiah is saying, you may forget my sermons, but never forget the high price our people paid for their sin against God. That also seems to be a lesson we are prone to forget. Now, a lament is a prayer of sorrow or anguish that's honest with God, and it's honest about God. It's not wrong to feel anger or anxiety or depression, but a lament helps us to do something with these emotions. And instead of getting stuck in these emotions, a lament causes us to take it to God and to find help there. So the first point of our lesson is from despair to hope. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. And according to this point, it says that we're going to see Jeremiah go from despair to hope. Now, the first 18 verses of this chapter, you see Jeremiah in despair. He almost gives up on God. And yet, something happens to change that. And so what I want to do with the class is I want to just walk through these verses and just give a bit of an exposition. And as I'm doing that, I'll also have an opportunity uh, to ask questions and engage them in that conversation about the text. In verse 19, remember my affliction and my homelessness. 
the wormwood and the poison, I continually remember them and have become depressed. Now we know from the word remember from previous studies that it means more in Hebrew than just simply to recall information. Remembering in the Hebrew mindset was, yes, recalling something, but recalling it to act upon it. Uh, Ecclesiastes we talked about where it says, uh, remember your creator in the days of your youth. And he's not simply saying, just remember God. He's simply saying, remember and act upon seeking after God. And so he said, I, I remember my affliction. The word affliction is oftentimes associated with war. And this word uh, talks about a disability or distress or even material poverty. And you can see that that would be a case with war. Homelessness. These people are walking to Babylon and they have no homes, just mainly the things that they can carry on their way to Babylon. Maybe the closest that we see something that we're aware of in the news is the terrible fires that took place in Hawaii where everything of people's possessions were wiped away. So he remembers his affliction. He remembers his homelessness. And then he remembers the bitterness of these experiences, uh, how they, the calamity and the cruelty and the sorrow. That's the idea of wormwood and poison. And he says in verse 20, these things are etched in my memory. When I think about these things, they lead me to depression. But then something happens between verse 20 and verse 21. There doesn't seem to be much of a gap in terms of the verses on the page, but in terms of the change in the man's thinking, there is a a grand Canyon in terms of a difference of way of thinking. Look what he says in verse 21. Yet, in other words, I began to think differently. And we've known for uh, all of biblical history, and it's one of the great discoveries of psychology that a way a person thinks changes a way a person acts. Now listen, yet I call this to mind Therefore, I have hope. This word hope is a word that has about it the idea of waiting with a sense of certainty. It was used uh, to describe Noah waiting and hoping about the flood waters going down. It has this confident expectation. It's a synonym for trust. So he says, yet I call this to mind. Therefore, I have hope. Hope. In other words, he's taken control of his thoughts and he's beginning to think in a different way. And here's what he's here's what he had here's the reason he has hope in verse 22. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. Now your leader's guide goes into this discussion of faithful love and its translation of this untranslatable. Hebrew word hesed is so often translated different ways, sometimes steadfast love, sometimes the old King James loving kindness. Here it's called faithful love. It's not just that God's faithful to us. He's dependable. He's reliable. He's consistent. It's not just that, but it's that plus the fact that he loves us. And because of his love for us, notice he says, God's mercies never end. Again, the commentary goes into the description that this word mercies, that in its root, in its etymology, it describes a woman's womb where her baby is, the, the things she loves that she carries near to her heart. And it's describing the tenderness, the concern, the, the focus, uh, the passion, uh, the care that a mother has for her baby. She can be absolutely exhausted, worn out by the day, falls into bed uh, uh, ready for some sleep, and in 30 minutes that baby sucks in air a little wrong. And what happens? That mother will be out of that bed to check on that baby. What is it that motivates somebody to do that? You couldn't pay somebody to do it. It's because of this mother's compassion, this mother's love, for that baby. And that's this word when it talks about mercies. Now, look what he begins to think on. He'd been thinking on the destruction 
that happened and it's etched in his memory. And then his mind turns and he begins to think about God. And he's thinking about the nature of God. And what he comes to realize is God has never stopped loving me. Here in the midst of all of this and all of this difficulty, God has never stopped loving me. And not only that, his mercies never end. He never stops having this kind of an affection and compassion for me. And then here's the heart of the book in verse 23. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The word great there means sufficient for every situation. Now, isn't this a beautiful picture? Here you come to the end of a day and you have just blown it. You, you have taxed God's love and His faithfulness towards you. You have exceeded, you think, His mercies. You have just, you have just blown it. And you go to bed discouraged, depressed. And in the next morning when you wake up, there's the container called faithful love. And there's the container called mercies. And they're full again. And you have an entire day in which to experience again God's faithful love. And he says in verse 24, I say the Lord is my portion. And the, again, the leader's guide does a good statement about describing the issue of portion and how that was aligned to Levi. And, and the point is, they're losing their land. They're not going to have their land. But like the tribe of Levi, they have something that can never be taken away from them, and that is the very presence and the being of the Lord God. Therefore, I will put my hope in Him. Now, in uh, uh, taking this text and applying it, um, one of the questions I want to ask the class after we've had a time of engaging with this wonderful this wonderfully rich text is, I want to ask them, how does hitting bottom bring about hope? Because this is what verse 19 is about. He has hit bottom. And, and so we, we all talk about the uh, fact that somebody's got to hit bottom before they finally begin to see the truth. So, so how does hitting bottom get, bring us to Hope. And what I'm thinking of is, you know, in some of the painful experiences of life, whether it's a marriage or whether it's an addiction, um, people, people have to get to the point where they take whatever that problem is, whatever that sin is, they have to take it seriously. They have to come to the point where they, they say, I want to avoid that sin all over. When they finally hit bottom, they stop making excuses. They stop putting up their defenses. And, and so one of the ways I'm wanting to maybe apply that to get the people thinking along those lines is, you know, an, a problem of someone in a marriage. Sometimes the marriage has to go to rock bottom before, or it has to hit on the rocks, we say, before the marriage begins to really improve. And, and I want to play off of that. That's what I think is happening here with Jeremiah. He had gotten to the point where anything and everything he may have put his hope in was removed, is removed from the people. And the only thing he had left was God. And that's when he finds that God is more than enough. Many good things in your life probably are the result of some time you hitting bottom. So just as quickly as the prophet was tempted to bitter thoughts, he adopts a better line of thought. And, and what you notice here is he doesn't remember 10 things that are true. He remembers one or two things that are true. He remembers God's faithful love. And he remembers God's mercy. Now, I, I would ask them, instead of giving that to them, I'd ask them, he doesn't remember 10 things that are true, but he does remember some things that are true. And what are those things? And we talk, and hopefully the answer will be faithful love and mercies. And, and, from, and if you can remember one thing that's true in the time of your dilemma, that in itself has the power to change you. And I thought one of the ways that we could apply this 
lesson, uh, this point of the lesson, is just ask for some testimonies. Just ask some people, do, do you have a testimony of a time when you were experiencing a difficulty and in the midst of that difficulty, you encountered God in a fresh way? And how did that help you? And, and just have some testimonies. You, you may, want, may need to give a testimony to just kind of prime the pump to get people to talking. So the first point is, um, is this issue of um, from despair to hope. And the second point is from waiting to seeing. And here, um, these verses reveal the nature of faith. And so let's, let's uh, list what they're teaching. And so uh, verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. So what is it telling us about the nature of faith? Uh, it says that people with faith seek God. That's what I'm looking for in that text. By the way, it says the Lord is good. Now, the word good can be relative uh, depending on your situation. For example, uh, if my football team wins, that's good. But for the opponent, that's not so good. But the word good here is based on the character of God. Anything that aligns with the character of God, the purpose is the will of God, is good. So the Lord is good. And anything that aligns with His nature and His character, His promises, His will, uh, the Lord is good to those who wait for Him, who have that expectation, that trust in Him, to the person who seeks Him. So the nature of, the nature of faith He's talking about going from waiting to seeing is someone who seeks God. Verse 26, it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And so I want to ask them, what, what are we talking about here? It's an attitude free of complaint. Uh, verse 27, it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is still young. And again, your leader's guide has some explanation for that. But an animal uh, had a yoke on it so that it would be guided to accomplish the purposes of the farmer. And this is the idea of the yoke. It is a divine judgment that is used by God to direct His people towards the right behavior. And so it, it learns discipline from the Lord. That's the nature of faith. And then, verse, uh, and then of course, the text, your leader's guide points out that these three verses all start with the word good. And then verse 28, let him sit alone and be silent, for God has disciplined him. Uh, silence is a form of acceptance of God's will. And it's when we're silent that we can contemplate what God's doing in our life and see the, the way that God is working. Uh, verse 29, let him put his mouth in the dust. Perhaps there is still hope. Now that was the ancient way of acknowledging complete submission to another to get on your face before them. And you'll see that these are increasing in their severity. And then the last, let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him. Let him be filled with disgrace. That's talking about total surrender, humbly accepting God. And so these are the, these are the things that I see as the nature of faith. Let me suggest to you to research on the internet uh, this title, Ron Dunn, and his last name is spelled D-U-N-N, -N, Ron Dunn interview with Manly Beasley. M-A-N-L-E-Y, Manly Beasley, part one. These two men are now in the presence of God. Both men were powerful teachers of the Word of God. But they're talking about suffering. It's an interview. And Manly Beasley had terrific health issues nearly all of his adult life. And much of what you've been studying in Lamentations is going to come out in this interview between Ron and Manly. And what I'm going to do with my class, the, the, the article may be a little too long. You may want to abbreviate it or just read it and have it as a part of your information to share. But I'm going to ask a class member to be uh, read Ron's part, and then I'm going to ask another class member to read Manly's part, and then I'm going to give them a copy, the class, a copy of this, and go through it. And it's 
It's very powerful. And I just, I'm going to ask the class now as Ron and Manley have this interview, just, just make a note on that page where they touch on some of the things we've talked about in our lesson. I also want them to take that piece of paper home because it's something that is so rich, I think it's something they'll want to read again in the week to come. And then I'm going to discuss it uh, after we have this interview. What did, you, what did you see in there that we've talked about in our text? The third point is from rejection to compassion, chapter 3, verse 31 to 33. Uh, why can we accept life's trials and tribulations in quiet co confidence? Well, verse 1, for the Lord will not reject us forever. This is not permanent. God will not reject us forever. Number 2, even if He causes suffering, He will show compassion according to the abundance of His faithful love. God's compassion, God's mercy outweighs, is deeper, is longer than our sorrow. And he does not enjoy bringing affliction. Verse 33, for he does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering on mankind. We go from rejection to compassion, and he gives us these three reasons here. God uses historical events of suffering to accomplish his purposes. And that's what's happening with Jerusalem. They've had this horrible experience because of their sin, but he uses it to accomplish his purposes. But you can see that in American history too. When you think of the revolution, the American Revolution, it was a horrible time of suffering for many people, and many people died uh, because of the war. And yet what came out of that? Freedom. Freedom for the, for the United States of America. And from that nation, freedom that spread around the world. In, in our nation's history, there's the Civil War. And what came out of that horrible event? More human beings died in that war in American history than all the wars combined in terms of their death. And yet, what came out of that is this plague of slavery was thrown off. What about the Depression? There are many positive things that came out of the Depression. But one of those was Social Security. And many people have some level of security because of what came out of the Depression. And then the Cold War between the United States and Russia. That resulted in a race into space. And so many of the inventions, the very way I'm recording this, is a result of the space race. And that came out of the... So there are, there are bad things that God can use to bring to good. When it comes to difficulties, oftentimes we look at the... We look at God through the lens of our difficulty. If we're having a hard time, and we look through that lens of our hard time at God, we see God as harsh. If we're experiencing some kind of deprivation and uh, shortness, we look through that experience at God, and we think that He's stingy or He's uh, not caring. But the Scriptures are teaching us that we're supposed to look at the events through the lens of God. In other words, when we're going through these kinds of events, we, if we look at the fact that God is faithful in His love, then we know that this event is not an enduring event. It's, it one day will be resolved, and in that, God will do something good in our life. And so this is, this is one of the ways in which uh, Jeremiah mind begins to think differently. Now to close the lesson, I want to take them to the ultimate example of trusting God to bring good out of suffering, and that's the cross. And I simply want to ask them these three questions. How was despair turned into hope at the cross? Second question, where is waiting turned into seeing at the cross? And third, why is rejection turned to compassion at the cross. The answer to all of our troubles and our, our difficulties so that God's people have peace can be found at God's work at the cross. God bless you for teaching the book of Lamentations.